welcome to the Bigger Boat Podcast. So we're the movie podcast talking about Steven Spielberg's films, going through them one by one. And today is, as you may have be already aware, the Schindler's List episode. So should be fun. Yes, thanks for this curveball, Stephen. <laughs> Do you remember I said on the second episode, the Jaws episode, wow, it really helps that, you know... The second one that you do is the biggest movie ever. Yes. Well, we always knew that this uh, curveball was going to be thrown at us half, approximately halfway through. Yes. So, so thank you, Stephen. For it's that. difficult to know how to deal with it, isn't it? It is. But you've heard him already. I'm Luke, and you've already heard Joey. I think it's probably important that we do do a little disclaimer before we start. So we are going to be chatting about Schindler's List. But as you've noticed in any of the previous episodes, we are quite light-hearted and we do try and make each other laugh so we will be talking about some serious stuff but if we do make each other laugh we're not laughing at the holocaust or the jewish faith or trying to shy away from anything that happened we're just two idiots trying to make talking about films trying to make each other laugh yes about so, steven spielberg about and, exactly and, and this is in his canon it's a very serious very big part of his career so we can't we cannot shy away from it so exactly so whether we we're, whether we're making each other laugh or talking about serious stuff we're always mindful and respectful Respectful of the source of where all this came from. Yes. So that's just a little disclaimer. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> You're very welcome. And to remember, if anything comes across as offensive, remember Joey's in charge of the edit, so it's his fault. <laughs> <laughs> How are you anyway, Joey? Uh, I'm good, thank you. How's your week been? Yeah, it's been quite busy actually. Now, you say this every week. Do I? I've noticed on each one, you're like, well, I'm quite busy this week. Yeah, really well, it has busy. been quite busy. I've had quite a busy social life this week. Well, actually, I found it trouble trying to fit in watching Shinder's List this week. We're going to do it a bit differently for some of our episodes. So normally we, we do the intro, then we watch the film on the day. But for some of the more serious or some of the longer films, just finding the time is difficult. So we're going to go and watch them beforehand. And that's what we did this week. Yes. Finding the time to watch Schindler's List, which is three hours and 20 minutes long, is quite difficult, to be honest. It is. So yeah. I've just been trying to find some time to do that, to be honest. But have you had a chance to watch any other films this week? I Oh, good segue. I have, actually. So um, what I watched last week, actually, was a film called First Reformed. Right. Have you heard of it at all? First Reformed. It, it came out this year and it's got Ethan Hawke in it. No, I haven't seen Okay. It. It's a really good film. I'd recommend you watch it. It didn't get much of a wide release here. So Ethan Hawke plays a priest who is quite lonely, alienated, having a bit of a crisis of faith, got a bit of a problem with alcohol. And he basically gets asked by one of his parishioners, played by Amanda Seyfried, to speak to his her husband, who is this like environmentalist radical who is convinced that the earth is, you know, dying and we're killing it and doesn't want to bring a child into the world. Right. And that sort of sparks something in Ethan Hawke's character where he gets more angry and angry at the world. And this builds and builds and builds until the conclusion. Obviously, it won't spoil anything at all. Yeah. But it's 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 one of those films that, that really stays with you. It's directed by Paul Schrader. Right. Who is the guy... I think we may have mentioned it in one of our previous podcasts. Because he had a... Either did a rewrite or a first draft. Was it either Jaws or Close Encounters? I can't remember which one. Close Encounters. Was it Close Encounters? Yes. yes. So, um, also, yes, it was. Because he, he had more religious overtones with that, didn't he? Yes. Because he also wrote Taxi Driver. Yes. And that's that's the big touch point for this because this feels like a born again taxi driver. Oh, does it? It does. It, it the the character, although different, has a lot of similarities with Travis Bickle. Right. In fact, he's alienated. He's railing against a system that is not listening to him. Yeah. Uh, and he that's, goes. That's the Robert De Niro character. Exactly. Luke's, Luke's talking about. And he goes to extremes in order to um, try and find some sort of worth. Yeah. Exactly. This is. This is very much like a religious taxi driver. Oh, right. It's, it's really interesting and it's so well acted. I will check that out. Have you ever seen um, Pickpocket? It's um, no, really directed by Robert Bresson. No, I don't know. Quite don't a know famous that. French uh, film director. No. It was made in the 50s. Paul Schrader loves Pickpocket. Okay. Um, and it's basically a retelling of uh, Crime and Punishment. Okay. But he contemporises the, the story. Uh, you know how, like, 2001 uh, is very still... Yes. In a very almost sort of religious way. Yeah. Uh, that's very, very similar. And it's definitely had a big impact on well, Schrader. You know how it's like there's times in Taxi Driver where very little actually happens? Yes. But you can't help but watch and find meaning in him staring at a glass of water and things like that? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's quite a Catholic overtone, I think. Yeah, he, he, it's interesting you say that, that sort of stillness, because it feels like everything is very quiet 
and understated and it's shot in a very boxy way everything is framed everything is within almost like he's sort of imprisoned and contained yeah but the message the underlying message is he's Paul Schrader is sort of shouting it out he's really angry he's really but everything is simmering under the surface and it's very very contained in the film I think Ethan Hawke should be nominated for an Oscar for this really yeah I think it's very very impressive so I I, I really like that I'd, there's one scene that didn't work for me where it's sort of like a, a fantasy sequence where he's sort of flying through the environment, which is being like there's pictures of forest fires and things like that. It was that was a bit too on the nose, but everything else is it's, it's a film that I've been thinking about for the last week. I oh, really, uh, yeah, I really liked it. I will yeah. check it out. So, have you watched a film this week, Joey? I have um, one which was on Netflix, but I'd heard about it and kind of wanted to see. It's called Walt Before Mickey. No, okay. It's about Walt Disney before he came up with Mickey Mouse. Documentary or a? No, it's a film. Okay, a fiction film, and it's it was an independent film. It was made in 2015. Yeah, sorry, and it stars yeah Thomas Ian Nicholas, who's probably best known as playing Kevin in um, American Pie. Oh, right, Tom okay. Tornado, wonder, yeah, boy, yeah. boyfriend of wonder, Tara Reid. <laughs> wonder what happened to him. Uh, yeah, he's he's apparently starring in Walt Disney. Because he has got an interesting backstory, Walt Disney. Yeah. He did have a couple of failed attempts at animation. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of what it covers. Okay. But the trouble is, it clearly was an independent movie. I think when you hear Disney, you think quite big budget, quite polished work. Yes. And there was an irony in that there was almost like a theme of the story was they kept talking about the quality of the finished work and the animation. <laughs> really? Okay. It was almost like put a bigger spotlight on... On, uh, on how on it the, lacks. On the lack. Of, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say... If anyone's interested, you should check that film out for the reason that it is a absolutely classic example of not enough time and money. Okay. There is nothing you can really like direct. There's not one thing you can directly point your finger at and say, that's what makes it a bad movie. Yeah. It's all of the little things adding up. Mm -hmm. You can tell they rushed into production and apparently the director was brought in very last minute. Yeah. And then who plays Roy Disney... His older brother uh-huh. is um, the guy from Napoleon Dynamite. John Heder. Yeah. Yeah. And the dialogue, it treats the audience very, very dumb, which is really bad. Like we do. <laughs> <laughs> so that came out 2015, right? Yeah. So is that around the same year as Saving Mr. Banks? The uh, other Disney I, movie? Yeah, very much, yeah. yeah probably, so they all come at the same time, don't they? These yeah, se- they do. Like the, We've had two um, ones about Christopher Robin recently, haven't yeah, we? Yeah, exactly. Snow White, Jungle Book, yeah. all these. Yeah, they all come all come at once for some strange reason. Yeah. So here's an example. Obviously, it's a, a period film. Yeah. It covers uh, Walt Disney from something like 1919 to 1923 or something. And, for example, there's a shot... As a couple of scenes on a train. Yeah. And obviously, like, usually when you record it, obviously, yeah, the train is not usually moving anyway. Because mm-hmm. you want nice, clear sound, and you do something with the back background of the window and stuff to make sure. sure it looks like it's moving. Whether that be green screen these days, used to use rear proje- projection, which means you have a projector shoot its light through a screen. Okay. And you're filming from the other side of it. Basically. Okay. This, couple of these scenes literally <laughs> look like they went to the transport museum yeah in london yeah and found an old train and stood by them and recorded their scenes that way yeah. as if they couldn't move their camera one way or the other because actors have to step in front of the camera okay and then also there's scenes in the carriage and there is no sound of an engine of any atmosphere outside, no smoke. Do you know how loud yeah, yeah, yeah. a steam train would be even if it was, like, still? Like, have they got, like, people holding backgrounds running past the windows <laughs> as well? No, it's just black outside. Right, okay. And then they're saying, enjoy it's your time. Ju- <laughs> like, enjoy your journey. And yeah. they're like, I don't know where they're going to be going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, one to, one to watch then. One to watch because it, it's a classic example of just like, yeah, not enough time and money. And that includes the script. You're like, it that reads on screen like a first draft script. Okay. They knew what they had to get across and then they spoon feed it to you. Okay. 
and it's like you clearly needed another five or six drafts because slowly it would come through. Yeah. What information the audience already knows, how you implant the sense that he felt worthless to his father Mm -hmm. rather than have Walt Disney actually say to his fiance, I do all of this. I don't stop working because my father thought I was useless. Yeah. You need to... Imp- Show it, don't say it. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And it never really shows it. Where did you find this? In, like, dredging the, the base of Netflix? Yes. You went into some sort of Netflix hole and... Uh... Yes. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. As we mentioned before, this episode is about Schindler's List. A film that probably most people have seen. Do you think so? Or is it I one of those things so. that it's on the people's, oh, I should watch that list? I mean, speaking personally... They certainly screened huge sections of it. I don't can't remember if it was the whole thing in RE lessons, yeah, religious mem- education at school. I mean, but I remember watching this at school. But like you said, I can't recall like ever having a a three and a half hour period yeah. where they would have showed it to all to me. And maybe well, I was stre- just showed they clips. stretched it over epi- over various lessons. Did they? Okay, I think this wouldn't fit into a a double maths no. period, would it? No. Um, but certainly huge se- sections of it. So I don't know if I'd ever watched it all, to be honest. Really? Well, because all I, re- I remember scenes from it, definitely. But I don't remember the whole thing as a narrative. Ah. So either I've just forgotten it um, yeah. and there's just scenes that stay with me. Or we just showed like little clips of it. Yeah. So no idea. Thinking back to it, I wonder whether... I can't remember how much teaching they actually did in RE at my school because they made us watch Gandhi from beginning to end as well. So two incredibly <laughs> long films, uh, basically stretched out throughout the whole year, I imagine. By the time you get through those two. Your RE teachers just pick, like, Christianity? Done. Yeah. Ju- <laughs> Judaism? Done. Next. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, done. that's pretty much it. <laughs> so Schindler's List comes at quite an interesting part of... Um, Spielberg's career and we've mentioned it briefly in a few previous episodes because at the beginning of the 80s Spielberg had bought as in an attempt to become move away from his reputation of being just a blockbuster monkey yeah to try and make some more serious adult films he bought the rights to The Colour Purple Empire of the Sun and Thomas Keneally's Schindler's Ark all at the beginning of the 1980s 1982 1983 I think this came the book came out in 1982 yeah and he uh, optioned it pretty soon after that that. And um, Spielberg spent about ten a decade or so working up to making it, but even previously trying to pass it off to another filmmaker and just produce it. Right. So I think he was wanting to find other Jewish filmmakers to do it. He initially offered it to Roman Polanski, who I think had, I think his mother was a Holocaust survivor, or at least he had some re- very, very close relatives yeah. who I think died bo- in the Holocaust. I think both his parents were in were they? Okay. a concentration camp, yeah. Um, and eventually that fell through. He, I think he mentioned it to Martin Scorsese, who felt he should, it, he, he's not Jewish himself, but he felt he it should be a Jewish film, filmmaker who yeah. made it. He's, uh, Marcus Scorsese is quintessentially Italian-American. Absolutely, There's yeah, no yeah. getting away from it, yeah. I think. So I, I could probably agree with him on that. Yeah, that and <laughs> that he's not a Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Well, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, I think Billy Wilder as well thought this might be his last film. Right, yeah, uh, he's an Austri- He's an Austrian uh, Austrian Jew by yeah. heritage. Who, but- did, who did a great number of films, including... Sunset Boulevard that we mentioned. Absolutely. Some like it hot. Yep. Do you know the story of how um, Thomas Kennelly, the guy who, who wrote the book, found out about the story of Oscar Schindler? I don't know. Shall I tell you? Yes, please do. Well, sit down, Joey. Um, so, so essentially, Kennelly randomly met a Holocaust survivor while in a, a shop somewhere. There was a guy called Leo Page who was actually, his real name was Poldek Pfefferberg, right. who is a named character in Schindler's List. And he said, um, they got talking and said, I've got, a, I found out Kennelly was a writer and he's like, well, I've got the best story for you. And said, um, I basically told him the story of how Oscar Schindler um, saved his life uh, during the Holocaust. And Kennelly was fascinated by it, ended up moving in with Leo Page to get all the stories and then ended up writing Oscar Sch- uh, the story of Oscar Schindler. The real Schindler had died at this point, but the guy, Leo Page, had tried to get this, mi- had tried to get this story out there beforehand, even while Schindler was still alive. Oh, right. um, he'd optioned it, or it even got so far as being optioned by MGM to be made into a movie. Right. Um, I don't know if you... Did you know this at all? So I think in 1963... They'd actually move forward. There was a script by Howard Koch and they were going to cast Sean Connery as Oscar Schindler. No, I didn't know any of yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, 
Oh. But it fell through, which is I just found really. So I don't know what that what form that movie would have taken at all. Yeah. It probably wouldn't have been anything like the movie that we see Spielberg having made. No. Imagine. When you when you hear MGM, you think Technicolor, like very bright images. Exactly, it yeah. would be very film starry. Yes, exactly. It? it would not. It would not be a cold, hard documentary feel. Yeah, look, especially with Sean this. Connery, who probably was James Bond at this point. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I don't know exactly why that fell through, but that fell through. But uh, Leo Page got paid for it and gave some money to the real Oscar Schindler, who was bankrupt at this point. Oh, right. And uh, then eventually it came to the attention of the author, Thomas Kennelly, uh, which is something that subsequently got bought by Spielberg. And we have the movie now. So as we said before, we've already watched the movie, so we're not going to take a little break. So we'll just go straight into it. From what we said beforehand about the origins of this and that Spielberg sat on this for 10 years trying to find someone else to make it, why do you think he waited that long? Do you think he needed to change as a filmmaker in order to produce this film? I feel I feel like maybe he needed to change more as a person and not a filmmaker. Okay. I would say more like on a personal level. That's what it feels like when I see interviews with him. This is a whole debate, isn't it, between like the artist and the art that they produce. Yeah. And we've talked about before about Spielberg being not immature, mm-hmm. because you have to be quite mature because you are ultimately responsible for... Yes. A, a very large budget in his yes. case and that includes work for people and uh-huh. delivering the things that you signed the contract saying you would deliver yeah you know saying that you can see how it might take someone to get to their mid-40s to want to make this true to the level that you th- feel like you now could I guess I think it's probably both I think it is changing as a filmmaker and as a person yeah. like you said when you get to that age he's I made so he, many films you do he? start looking about I guess you do start looking about where you came come from, what was important to you. A lot of filmmakers start looking at their heritage yeah. and um, where they came from. Yeah, and I guess that's that classic, I'll say it, midlife crisis. So it's sort of like, it's sort of, yeah. Who, who exactly am I? Where am I going? Yeah, where have I come from? Yeah, and especially because I guess the Holocaust hasn't been represented hugely. Yeah, on cinema, the only one I can really think of that's that famous would be Sophie's Choice yeah. from the early seventies. But there's not. But I also think he needs to change he needs to change as a filmmaker as well because we talked about from the color purple that he didn't really know what he was he never made a dramatic film like this before he needed a lot of sort of help from his peers from people like David Lean from his influences to yeah. sort of know what he's doing and having had the more dramatic films now in his uh in his past and the experiences learned from them maybe it now has allow, allowed him to make the most dramatic film that he's made so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does feel like a lot of what he's learnt has been put into Schindler's List. Absolutely. And I feel that Schindler's List is just a cut, as a film itself, is a cut above the other dramatic yeah. entries that he's had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a clear difference. I was it trying, is I was excellent trying, filmmaking. Yeah, I was trying to think. Because, let's face it, both... The Colour Purple has got some harrowing things associated with it. The Colour Purple is very much like a personal story. Yeah. It's that. It's Seelies, who is just one woman living this awful life in this quite small community, really. And do you remember we talked about, like, where's the pleasure in watching this? Yeah. I wrote down that question to ask myself as I was watching it. It's so so important historically to think about the past and the future because I feel like it's so... It leaves such an imprint. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting where you say about, you know, I completely agree that it's not... This is not entertainment but that's not the purpose of this he he didn't try and make that movie no he said he wanted it as a historical document and it feels that way it feels like it is trying it is focusing on a it is a story of oscar schindler and the people close to him but it's also the story it's peppered with stories from some of the jews who suffered during the holocaust itself and it's trying to comment more broadly on the holocaust itself apparently he apparently has put a few personal stories together so that we can follow a certain character exactly and we get the general gist of the experiences of many jewish families it's true but it didn't all happen to that particular character that you might see on screen exactly otherwise he said he would end up with hundreds of storylines exactly which were unrelatable which is true and yeah exactly you need to make some cuts to in order to make a, a coherent narrative yeah and i find actually a lot of the 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 jewish people a lot of the survivors I didn't get their names. I didn't, couldn't quite follow their families. Yeah. But that didn't matter as such. Yeah. You still got their stories. Yeah. Which... It was it was witnessing them in their particular circumstances. Absolutely. Yeah. It was first seeing them in the Jewish ghetto 
And then, you exactly. know, following the same faces on the trains and you're thinking, oh, oh God, I've got a terrible feeling about where they're going. And yeah. All of this kind of stuff. So before we get really talking about the, the movie, yeah, just because I've heard uh, Spielberg talk about his upbringing and things. Yeah. So we talked about, you know, the fact that he has father issues and all this stuff. Yeah. Uh, I've never really mentioned this before as well, but we know he knows dyslexic and um, he's been officially uh, diagnosed with dyslexia as I am a, a dyslexic quite late on in life. He didn't get very good grades and this is why he didn't end up at the same film score as George Lucas. Yeah. Oh, is that right? He ended up having to go to one in uh, Long Beach because he didn't get the... His grades weren't quite good enough. But then you also hear him mention quite a lot in interviews. Jewishness, as he describes it, set him apart because I'm not sure there was many other Jewish people around. No, he did feel... Where he was growing up. So that also made him feel isolated. And I think he did get a bit of, you know, abuse because of a bit of bullying because of his Jewishness. He felt like a bit of an outsider. Uh, So let me ask you, like, to what extent do you think... Do you think in his previous movies, do you think we seen any of his to use his term Jewishness because I don't think any of the families that you sort of I can't think of a clear example where you look at a particular character in his movies and say like that's a Jewish perspective that's a, do you know what I mean true uh, the only thing I can think of is that I'm probably not the right person to really because I'm not <laughs> keyed in to you know the representation of Judaism on screen in general yeah. but and when you said that I thought immediately of Richard Dreyfus. He, he's Jewish isn't he yeah yeah, yeah. because he's a Jewish so, son yeah, exactly so Richard Dreyfus, who we know Spielberg has used as a sort of surrogate for himself in a movie now he, in any of the movies he's been in so yeah. always Close Encounters and Jaws he's not really there's nothing religious about no him apart from maybe in Close Encounters there's nothing specifically Jewish uh, Jewish yeah. about it that I could yeah. think I could think of but little things thinking back so you know how Jaws is from the point of view of a middle class sort of typical family yes it's like well, it was just knowing that the, the two leads are Jewish yeah it's like you know you don't you don't see any I'm religious not... iconography on the walls or anything like that no I I, I just not, I'm not sure it spilled over no. really no. did you, th- could you, you think, think... Well, I'm curious to know whether do you think he was hide- hiding it or uh, or is it just not an issue? I really don't know. I really don't know. If you think about the timings of when he bought the rights to Schindler's Ark, yeah. this would have been between E.T. and Raiders around that time anyway. So before that, he's only really made three or four movies. Yeah, it's, this is the artist art debate, isn't it? Yeah. Because it could be that isolation which then led to the feeling that he wanted to implant with E.T., but you don't know whether it comes from this, this you, can't, is... you can't isolate some someone's personality down into like certain things, can you? No, you can't you say can't, you can't yeah. really completely cut them off as being oh he gets that feeling of isolation from you know from his um, upbringing or, no. or, or 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 any particular aspect of his upbringing. Yeah. And this is all speculative, isn't it? It's all speculative. It's all yeah. completely you, speculative. So yeah. absolutely no idea. Because yeah. <laughs> we can't answer for him. And I think <laughs> even if we asked him directly, I think he would struggle to answer. Because how do you I, know I when I you put yourself... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you don't know how much you put yourself... Of how much of yourself you put in the movies. Yeah. But we know that... I know that Spielberg did grow up with stories of the Holocaust. Now, we said he got bullied a little bit. For He said himself he got bullied because of his... Um, faith. He had. He didn't. He had any first degree relatives that were involved in the Holocaust itself. Yeah, I've heard but him say that. Apparently, there's a story that goes around that his mum told him. His mum had a friend in Germany who was a pianist, and she was Jewish. Her friend, the pianist, was playing a band symphony, and the Ger- some Germans came up on stage and broke all of her fingers. Oh really? Yeah, and. Her, his grandmother, apparently, who lived in Cincinnati, taught English to Holocaust survivors who came over to the United States. So, although there wasn't a direct, refer- you know, this is an inherent part of Jewish history. Yeah. And it, you can see it when Spielberg talks about it, that this weighs heavy on him, on his heart. Yeah. And must have been so difficult for him to film on a on a daily basis oh, definitely. in Poland, putting his actors through some of the things that nowhere near as close, nowhere near close to the yeah. horrors, but reenacting some of the horrors that would have been. Yeah, uh, I believe. So, for example, the shots in Auschwitz. That is Auschwitz. Is that actually that, Auschwitz? I believe it is. Yeah. You know, so that train going through those gates because yeah. that is still standing. I've actually been. You've been to Auschwitz. Yeah. Okay. There's two camps. There's one up the road. Yeah. I think that they're like a 20 minute walk from each other. Yeah. Once it's smaller and that. Uh, started by having a lot of including sort of Polish people Mm -hmm. that were opposed to the Nazi occupation sure 
as well as Jewish people, basically anyone that disagreed with them. Yeah. And that's the one which has got that sign, work will set you free. Yeah, Arbeit Max Frei. Yeah. yeah. And then there's a 20 minute walk and then you come in through, yeah, there's the railway and that is, yeah, it's all still standing, that frontage. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's sort of, uh, it's got that like clock and, and things and then yeah. you've got the, the wire f- fence on both sides of those tracks and, yeah, all that yeah. stuff. and it looks remarkably similar it looks exactly the same as it looks in the movie yeah which is which is harrowing yeah it's just very very surreal is the only way to describe it it's very it. surreal because you get to the point where you have to remove yourself a little bit and it's like oh this is not just a museum about it this this is it. The, like, yeah, it, this happened here. Yeah, this yeah. happened where I am standing. It, it's very, very odd. Mm-hmm. I, I, I went to a concentration camp by, on holiday by accident. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, duck out, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. To, we were doing a little trip around Germany, um, me and my wife, and we booked it quite last minute. And we booked some accommodation just outside of Munich. And we didn't really look where, where it was until we got there. And we're like, oh, we're staying in Dachau. <laughs> Right. And then, um, it, it was, so we ended up obviously going to the concentration camp and a very similar experience to, to you. It is a very surreal, humbling experience. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to the movie. So I've actually watched this in quite close succession, really. I had actually watched this probably about a week before you said, should we start a podcast? You'd watch Schindler's List just before? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I okay. realised I hadn't really seen it for a few years. You I know what of... I fancy doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. Actually, is what mood are you in to watch this then? When I, if I would think about when I would want to watch this again, I would think I would. I think it would be good to show either my kids or something like that when they get old enough as an educational tool yeah. about this is what humans are, can be capable of and this is what happened yeah. uh, in World War Two. I would not want to really go back and revisit this again. Yeah. What made you want to actually go see it uh, before all this? Well, basically, I just felt like it was time to revisit it. It's, yeah, it's the only sure. way I can describe it in the okay. broadest sense. Yeah. I felt it was time to have that, that feeling again, that yeah. once you have been through or witnessed something quite uh-huh. horrific, having your perspective changed on things. Yeah. You know, whether it might be... I'm going into my own psyche here. Whatever, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, if you've had a bad day at work... Yes, your day is going to be very changed if you watch this movie after because you're going to realise that things really aren't that bad. Yes. Yeah, that's true. That is so true. that was the point of view I was sort of coming from. Yeah. So, so sorry, yeah. The, my point of like having just watched it, you know, only a few months ago mm-hmm. and now re-watching it actually enabled me to take myself away from quite a lot of the horror this second time. Yeah. And think about the filmmaking yes. part of it and work out kind of what he's doing. That's interesting. And what, what comes through when you... Because very much for me, I just focused on the horror yeah. of it all and yeah. it because it, it really is affecting. Yeah. But so I think you're going to have a lot more insights than I will <laughs> yeah. about the whole movie making process itself. Yeah. So obviously it's very different in terms of style as to what Spielberg would normally do. We know he was working on Jurassic Park at the same time. Which is mad to think about, isn't it? So he had already shot Jurassic Park and then he was working on the post-production. So he was filming in Poland for Schindler's List. Yeah. And then he was getting the train to Paris and overseeing the sound and things for Jurassic Park. Yeah. And he sort of quoted it as saying, like, Jurassic Park took all of his sort of technical know-how. Yeah. And then Schindler's List took every part of his intuition yes which does come across mm-hmm. he said that he was sort of like set scenes up and things okay you people sort of he would say like okay you guys move this way yeah uh, and all of this kind of stuff and then kind of let people working in a much looser way yes let people sort of not improvise but sort of like just find their own feet and then he would document them in the same way that a documentarian would. And that's what I, I agree, because what I did write down is this feels like a almost like a documentary style. Yes. In it. And a lot of the stuff I can I can tell he's using handheld cameras. Yes. Much more. Tend to be quite long takes. Yes. And that sort of thing. Basically this to to use a filmy term, it's a sort of neo Italian style is what <laughs> cinephiles would, would say okay because there's a movie called you mean Pre- what pretentious people would say yeah so there's a movie called like the bicycle bicycle thieves an italian movie which yeah. is very very similar in terms of look and style yeah which is kind of similar to what we have mentioned before when we talked about um the french new wave but without any of those flashy i'm a, making you conscious that i am a movie stuff fast yes. cuts all of that's removed yeah, yeah and yeah. it just feels very much like a documentary or yeah because we we talked about the David Lean influence with uh, other movie of other more of his dramatic movies, but this does feel different to that. And he's sort of moved on and found his own yeah. voice in his own little style. 
he's very much lo- looking in on the horror. And there's a scene where like Schindler is on a horseback looking over as the uh, Jewish ghettos get cleared out and that he's sort of witnessing that massacre from far away. Yes. And that sort of very much feels like his sort of style of the whole story. He's not trying to make any sentimental judgments on anything. Yeah. He's saying he's just saying this happened. Yeah. This is how it happened. I'm not going to shy away from anything. You take yeah. what you you will from it. Compare that to like the color purple, where every single good moment or every single bad moment is alluded to by a very uh, a score that goes up or a yeah. uh, rousing thing that comes in saying yeah. you feel, you should feel this way, feel this way, feel this way. None yeah. of that's happening. He's very much shooting it. This is this is happening. Um, Interesting that you uh, picked that point. Cause, uh, there's two things I, I was going to mention about that particular scene. Sure. Firstly, I'm, yeah, I'm afraid to be so analytical for something so horrific. But yeah. as I say, this is my experience of watching it so closely together. Yeah. That is uh, another classic example of what we talked about in the Jaws episode, uh-huh. the Hitchcockian how to build empathy for a character. Can you remember we told you... The to, old man. The old man. Yeah. He looks, he sees baby being hugged by a mother cut back to the old man he smiles yeah you replace the middle one with a girl in a bikini and you've completely changed his character yeah from an empathetic old man mm-hmm. to a, a to a pervert exactly the same technique is being applied here mm-hmm. you're he's not he's not judging what liam neeson uh, oscar schindler is feeling yeah you're just witnessing it you're just seeing that his brain is processing yeah so he's on his horse on quite a high hill He's looking at the the ghetto being destroyed, Mm -hmm. um, everyone being moved, certain people being put against the wall and shot and all this stuff. And there is no sense that a judgment from Spielberg's point of view is being made. Mm -hmm. It is literally just uh, he's witnessing and making his own assessment as a character. Yeah. He's removed his filminess. Steven Spielberg yeah. is what I'm talking about, so that you just empathise with the character. Mm-hmm. And then I would also say the important thing about that scene is it, that's really the turning point, isn't it? I feel like because you see his cogs in his brain ticking over, yeah. that is what changes what I think is the main theme of this movie, Yeah, which is basically... So you have the Ray Fiennes character, Eamon Gerth, and for a lot of the movie... Well, for a third of the movie... They run parallel with each other mm-hmm. and they have the same aims almost. They love women. They yeah. love drinking. They love showmanship. Yeah. And and you even see Liam Neeson sympathising with him saying, oh, Gerth's yeah. not that bad. I do you genuinely know? think they were actually friends, yeah. friendly towards each other. I don't yeah. think, certainly to begin with, I do not believe or what comes across that they were sucking up to each other. No. I do think there was a genuine actual connection between the two of them wanting the same In thi- the film, things. In the film, I agree. Oh, in the book, actually, apparently they didn't like each other from the start. Okay. But in the okay. film, I agree that they, they've they done this. Yeah. Spielberg's made a conscious decision to do this. Yes, to show that they are similar. They are travelling on a very similar path. Mm-hmm. But then you have that scene where Liam Neeson is on that horse and he's witnessing that. And he spots. that's when he spots the little girl in the red coat. Yep. Who we later find out later has been killed. Yep. That's when they really start switching. Yeah. It's interesting framing and things because in their first conversation mm-hmm. where they're sort of in um, Riffine's office, they're, they're talking about, he's talking, Eamon Goeth is moaning about his work that he has to do. Like, oh, you have to find camps for them. You have to do this. Exactly. I've got to feed yeah, yeah, them. Yeah. I've got to, yeah. Yeah. And there's an interesting bit where he, did you notice Liam Neeson, he had like a bit of tobacco or something on his lip okay. and then he sort of almost bits like he like because you've been through he's like Ray Fine says I know I've been through it and he says yes you know you've been through it and spits the bit of tobacco out okay it's as if it's sort of like yo whatever yeah he's trying to spit those words out of his yeah yeah but a- but but actually he by this point yeah he hasn't made that conscious decision it's as if he's on the fringes at that point mm-hmm. and then yeah he witnesses oh, when he's on the horse I'm gonna tread a, a different path yeah and he decides to use his wealth and and showmanship yes to get beyond the regime yeah because i ne- i completely forgot that Liam Neeson's so Oscar Schindler was at the start not sympathetic yes. you know he is an opportunist he is trying to make money out of the war even he yeah. says in conversation you know war is best for business yeah, this he's is a war profiteer exactly and yeah. he's come he's, he's enjoying Krakow and he's aware i'm sure he's aware that, of what's going on but he's not witnessed anything directly and he's happy to ignore it. He is he is culpable still. Yeah. He is still not, you know, I didn't realise he was 
unsympathetic to start off with. No, it's very much and, part of the part of the Nazi vote. And I think exactly he was, he was a Nazi. Yeah. And I really think that's a great choice that Spielberg made to because I think another filmmaker, a less experienced filmmaker, would have come in and gone. No, we have to have Schindler is the benevolent one. He has to be all good. He can't have those shades of grey. He can't have uh, be seen to be profiteering. Yeah. Spielberg comes in and makes him a much more complex character. And like you said, yeah. has parallels with one of the worst war criminals we've seen portrayed on film. Yeah. And then about halfway through the movie, so about an hour and a half in, have them part ways. But for the normal running time of a normal feature film, he is, you know, he is behaving as an opportunist, yeah. making money out of, you know, he's only hiring the Jewish people because they're cheaper. Yeah, to exploit them. Yeah. To exploit them, exactly. Yeah. And I, I thought very... that was a really good decision for, yeah. um, for for Spielberg to make. I would say it's a contender for the most complex character in a Spielberg movie. Yeah. Because even by the end, it's still, I st- he still doesn't sit that comfortably with, with me because I just cannot get away from the fact that he's, he's well, as, as portrayed in the movie, he is a war profiteer. Yes. Who then used that position for greater good. So is he a saviour hero or an exploiter? He's both. He's both, yeah, exactly. And he can occupy those yeah. two, but he can be a hero and an exploiter at the same time. Whereas Spielberg usually is very much in one a goody and a baddie yeah a goody and a baddie Absolutely, kind of yeah, yeah. stereotypes and you do see the way he makes the film actually there's a number of scenes where it represents that duality yeah um where he juxtaposes two scenes next to each other yeah so um he's very much shown in shade as well if you notice at the beginning oscar schindler yeah yeah he's very like over drapes and stuff from from windows and all this stuff but yes sorry you were talking yeah, yeah. about um the duality yeah so so for example like when the initial uh, scene where you see some jews get evicted to start off with is cross cut with schindler moving into his new new apartment yes yeah yeah, yeah. um we've got cross cuttings with uh the beating of helen hirsch who is um girth's uh maid with schindler's birthday party and a jewish wedding yes these are all things that are happening sort of simultaneously yes which is sort of trying to represent i think they're trying to represent the the duality of schindler's character very much yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i thought it was really clever remember this is what we talked about in terms of cross cutting yeah you can also call it montage theory as yes. well we talked about this in, specifically in um the purple yeah where you had the scenes in africa mirroring or not what was happening to Celie on her her yeah. farm in the southern yeah, yeah, states yeah. Of, of america yeah but it definitely works yeah there, there were i became so aware of so many of those cross-cutting moments even to the extent with little things so for example like when you have the death of the one-armed man you know the guy who had come to oscar schindler's office to say thank you so much yeah and then the older he's guy, just yeah. died well, the next scene is a sex scene. Yes. You know, it's just to really show the contrast of the decadence, the high living of the Nazis. Yeah. And the incredible lows exactly. of, the, of the enforced labour. And actually, that's, that scene is actually sandwiched. The scene where he's thanking it, Oscar Schindler is ignorant of it. He yes. doesn't want anything to do with the man. He's like, yep, yep, fine, fine, whatever. He tells... He's dismissing him. Then he gets out and gets shot and then he's having sex afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, It's sort of sandwiched, that sort of horror is sandwiched yeah. in between. Do you... Just to talk more filmically yeah. than, than emotionally, did you notice, do you remember we talked about Hitchcockian technique? Yes. Now, there was a classic example of, because you put the point really nicely because... Thank uh, you. Which was... Do you remember we were talking about building suspense? Yes. And we talked about the Hitchcockian thing of, I said, well, you need to always give people lots of information to begin with. Yeah. It's only once you realise the bomb is under the table yep. that it can be can become suspense. Yes. Because you said, because otherwise it, the result is shock, yeah. which is true. Yeah. Did you notice he did that quite a lot with scenes which were quite separate? Uh, did you notice that Spielberg was doing that quite a lot in this movie? So, for example, Ray Fiennes is set up as someone who comes in and he just shoots whatever is annoying him in that moment. Yes. So now we know that is how he reacts in most situations, mm-hmm. which then made it so much worse when he took that old hinge maker yeah. out into the back and the gun doesn't go off. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That is what makes that more excruciating is the fact that it's set up long before that mm-hmm. he shoots anything that's annoying him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's classic Hitchcockian suspense. Yeah. Done in a really subtle way. Yeah. Uh, to, to great, great effect, I would yeah. say. The other most, the other suspenseful moment that I thought you were going to allude to beforehand is the, probably one of the most distressing scenes, the, the, the shower scene where the women who get sent to Auschwitz 
end up being stripped naked. The women themselves have had a conversation in the previous labour camp. Yes. This was about probably an hour beforehand saying... Exactly. So, yeah, it's a saying, long, long setup up for exactly, this piece of suspense. Yeah. Saying that, you know, this is what they do. They gas some people in showers. They take them into the room. They take their clothes off. And then they go... They end up having their clothes take off. And you see the looks between the women. And and they start screaming before, don't they? As if they know Yeah, and they get up. in there and they start... They're really nervous. There's no... There's nothing they can do. They start screaming. And the lights go off suddenly. They start screaming. And then the showers go, go on. But it's water, not gas. Yeah. And then that that was one of the most suspenseful sequences. Yeah. I, I was I was I couldn't look away. I wanted to look away from the screen. I was just my head my hand was in my head was in my hands, just going, Oh god, oh god. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was harrowing, but you know, done incredibly well as a film because as a piece of film technique. As a pill film technique. Yeah. Because what you're doing is you're showing people you're telling people the horrible thing that did happen to the people who were gassed, but you're not showing it directly and you also are building suspense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's really great that... Because um, you remember a criticism we had of uh, Empire of the Sun? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Was that it? Didn't they didn't quite he didn't quite show the horrors of that camp enough? I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. I feel like now he really. I'm not saying he really went to town on it because it's in some ways what makes these kind of things more disturbing is the banality of some of it. Not building it up. Absolutely, it's just it's done. Yeah, it's and done. then you do, it doesn't. The camera doesn't move away. The and, camera doesn't. It just shows it. And one of the best moments like that, which is shocking for its blandness Mm -hmm. is do you remember after Ray Fiennes says I pardon you and he lets the young boy who's in charge of washing his uh, bath tub go he takes two pop shots and you think okay that's obviously just a warning cut to the next shot and it's Ben Kingsley walking from having obviously done some work for Oscar Schindler and directly at his feet is the body of the boy who he has clearly hit, hit with his aim it, it's a real mix, isn't it? Because there's some where it's shown off screen. There are some where it's shown in silhouette, like we've talked about. But there are some where someone gets shot in the head and you see the blood almost Tarantino-esque with yeah. arterial spurts spurt out. Yeah. I'm thinking of the, the female foreman who's in charge of building the villa. Yeah. She just get just gets shot and it's right there. Yeah. Uh, one of the older, older men, he gets shot in the street Again, just and then when um Girth is going round shooting every other man, yeah, who's just a, you know it's just it's there and the blood is it's quite quite graphic. It is quite graphic, yeah. Um, it's very very real, which is why it feels like a almost documentarian because there's no score there to tell you this is how you should be feeling. There is no focus or zoom in on the blood saying, oh, this is yeah. horrible. It's just yeah. handheld camera. This has happened. Yeah. And then Ray this Fine, is what for happened. example, and then, and then it's, you know, after you've had the blood, it's Ray Fine's attitude to that um, architect young lady yeah. where, uh, having just shot her. Tear it down. Do exactly what yeah, she yeah, said. We're not, we, right. we won't argue with these people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That attitude is... I wouldn't say it's as shocking as the blood, but it's yeah. unsettling. Yeah. Ralph Fiennes does an amazing job in this, doesn't he? I would say it's it's some of the best acting on, yeah. on film, yeah. I would say. I think he steals the show. It is incredible. The fact that he can be... Because Ralph Fiennes is, is someone who can be so charming sometimes. Yeah. But then has... He's played leading men in yeah. like, rom-com. Ex- I know. <laughs> and then just can have completely cold, dead eyes. Yeah. I find... Yeah. I find it amazing. He's he, he was one. It's one of the best performances I've ever seen. Yeah, it yeah. is. Yeah, um, and also it must have been really difficult for him to actually play this role so heartlessly. Yeah, yeah. He's just so good. He's what just sort so of belie- place do you go into? To... He's so believable. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of curious to know, like, yeah, yeah what gets you to that mindset? Yeah. How do you how do you how do you show up to work going? Bye, darling. I'm off to play. <laughs> I'm on girth. Yeah. Uh, and then you able to switch it on like that? Yeah. I, I yeah. Yeah. Remarkable. Because it's so it's so interesting because some of the very difficult things to do in acting is when there isn't that much going on. But I'm yeah. thinking of things like you know when he's having his nail polished. Yes. You know, and it just tilts up to his face, and you just know that he's thinking you know exactly what he's thinking yeah you know exactly what he's thinking he's actually thinking you know she's a beautiful yeah woman and he's planning something yeah for cruel for the evening and all of this stuff and it's all just in his eyes you're not there's no dialogue in that scene is there and but you know there's just a the odd move movement forward and yeah you know he's got nefarious uh he's got malintent yeah 
Just incredible. Yeah. You know how we mentioned that Spielberg does use Disney in quite a lot of his movies? Yes. I wondered what sort of parallels we could have with Pinocchio for this. Really? Yeah. So if you imagine like Oscar Schindler as Pinocchio halfway through, where Pinocchio goes to the pleasure island where, you know, all all your um all your needs are met. Yeah. But he's brought away by his conscience. I think Ejak Stern is sort of his Jiminy Cricket. Yes, that's true. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. yeah. And then eventually brings him back and sees him to his um uh, back to the good side. Yeah, yeah. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't know, I thought there might be a little parallel Maybe more with um, Stern being a, a conscience character. Yeah, yeah. For for Oscar Schindler. Yeah, because it's not overt, is it? He's not actually giving him strict advice. Don't do this. Do that instead. No. He's just saying like, oh, this happened. In fact, there's a time where he says, "What do you want me to do about it?" Yeah. And he says, "We are just talking, aren't we?" Yeah. I'm very much enjoying your German accent throughout <laughs> this, Jerry. By the way. <laughs> well, that's why we're talking about that. Um, I thought it was very well done. The fact that uh, you know. Most of the main actors are English, and they're doing German accents. Yeah, it, the tone, like it's it's very well done. It, it's not distracting, is it? No, you you are you're fully on board from the start, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 One of the things, another thing that I think is really interesting about making him a complex character is he's very different in and out of the spotlight. Oscar Schindler. Mm-hmm. Um, he's a, very much a showman when the lights are on. Yes. Oh. But then think of the first scene. He's in a really small, quite crummy yeah. apartment. Yeah. And then, you know, he's just got a bit of money. Yeah. And then he knows how to capitalise on yeah. his expensive suit and some money. He does look like a Hollywood film star, doesn't he? In yeah. those moments where he's presenting himself that yeah, way. Yeah, very much. You might know this. Is, there, is it filmed differently? Like the scenes where he's at the parties, where you've got the lavishness, and then the f- scenes where you're filming more in the ghetto... Is there some difference that in the way it's being shot? Because it feels, although it's all black and white, it does feel like it's a different feel. Yeah, it, feel. Wouldn't, it wouldn't be any one thing. Okay. But exactly what you're describing is the job of the cinematographer. Yeah. So you can use different film stocks. So some film stocks are more sensitive than others. So okay. basically, like, you might need more light. Yeah. But the result is a much sharper image. Okay. An example of someone who uses very slow or very insensitive film is Tarantino. Okay. So so that's why you have the colours of a Tarantino movie are very, very bright and it helps add to that slight comic book feeling some of his movies have. Okay. That's why like the white of the shirts are very white and the okay. red of the blood is very red and the, okay. the black of the uh, suit is very, very... Or in Reservoir Dogs, you mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah in Reservoir Dogs. Yeah. Like the colours are not grainy. Okay. Um, and that depends on like, yeah, what stock he use, film okay. stock he use, what, what film you're putting in the camera. So chances are they're different film stocks. You're probably using the more sensitive yeah. uh, a, a film stock, which would give you pr- probably a more grainy image and yeah. less lights for some of that more documentary stuff like the well, I guess cause getting did... rid of the ghetto and yeah. particularly like a lot of those SS soldiers going up into the hallways, telling people to, yeah. you know, throw their suitcase over the balcony or whatever. Yeah. yeah. That's very, there's not many artificial lights, is there, in that in that scene. Yeah. Well, so that's th- why, it, it's a combination of all these things yeah. and the production design, which would give you that feeling okay. of the grandeur of Oscar Schindler's parties yeah. versus the grainy real world feel that you mm-hmm. get. Uh, for some of the documentary stuff. Okay. We should probably give a shout out to the cinematographer who was called um, Janusz Kaminski. And because I did read something about something he did. Uh, in order to like, when he shot Oscar Schindler, yeah. he always sort of cut a tiny slit in a cardboard sheet and constantly directed a light towards Schindler. So he always had a gleam in his eye. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. As a little techniques to make him look more like a Hollywood film star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, that's how he wants to present himself to the high up in the Nazi party. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've kind of already mentioned this, but did you also notice, yeah, when he's not in the spotlight, there is a, quite literally a veil. A shadow, yeah. A yeah, shadow yeah. over yeah. the window where the light is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So there you go. It's like the, sh- the the veil is removed and then you have the Hollywood film star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, um, I cried at the end. Right at the end, what the, when the, the movie is finished, they, there's a sort of touching tribute to Oscar Schindler and the Jews who died, where the real the characters and their real life counterparts came and visited Schindler's grave yeah. and put 
some stones on on his grave in tribute that had me in absolute pieces and my wife came in and was like oh what's going on and i i actually i couldn't speak i couldn't explain it i, I couldn't get the words out yeah because it was just i don't know i've not yeah. felt like that in a very long time in a movie um yeah so i have heard some criticisms of that scene mm-hmm. so for example i mean people have criticized the fact that you know they have the gravestone there and they put the the rocks on and stuff but there's no mention that he's certainly the only member of the nazi party that has been he's uh, he's actually buried in jerusalem um, and certainly, yeah, the only member of the Nazi party to have that honour. And there's yeah. no mention of that. No, sure. Um, but it's just very much like... Uh, I think the criticism is more like they are... Um, conser- like, it's the end of Oscar Schindler's story mm-hmm. at the end of the movie and not his real life. It doesn't sort of tell you much beyond the yes. end of the war. True, but... Uh, that's again. That's not the point of the movie, is it? No, you're no. you're you're telling the story of the Holocaust via this man as, and you're using him as an entry yeah. point to tell yeah. a greater narrative. A greater narrative. It's not. It's not Oscar Schindler's story. He's just a device in it to tell the story of others. Yes. Uh, and what they've suffered. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think I. Yeah. I like that ending more and more as I get older. Yeah. Because. Let's face it, the way it's shot and everything, and I th- I think Spielberg sort of even admits this himself, he wanted it to be kind of timeless. Yeah. It's just a kind of like, look how cruel people can be. Yes. You know, in a general sense. Yeah. You know, and using this as an example of something which happened in the 40s. Mm-hmm. And so I think you can, to some extent, I think shooting something in black and white can make something both uh, more cold and factual. Yeah. And set it in quite a specific time, time. and things. Which can work for you. Yeah. Uh, but what I increasingly like as I get older about that ending is that, you know, it brings it back to 1993. Yes, it does, yeah. Which was when, you know, we were alive and watching Jurassic Park. Yeah. And it suddenly all feels very relevant and yeah. current in a yeah. strange way. Yeah. And I did feel this before uh, seeing that scene and things, but it just hammered home the point again. I mean, when that scene came on, I mean, I was just suddenly aware, you know, my gran was six when World War Two started. Yeah. And, you know, she's still alive and yeah. all of this kind of stuff. It mm-hmm. all feels very current. Yeah. And so I think it's important to remember that. It is weird to think we've got family members alive we where were, this happened. We were born 41 years after the end of the Second World War. It's not many. Which is not long, is it? No. It's mad. Mad. Because you could watch this film and feel like, well, it was years ago. Mm-hmm. And then with an ending like that, it does, it helps fill that time gap in my yeah. opinion. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you ever cry at films then? I do more now as I get older. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah I find yeah. it's worse now in my thirties yeah. than it is before. Yeah. Yeah. When I was young, and I feel like a lot of people sort of do this because they like horror more when they're younger because it's a little bit of a macho, like, yes, I can watch the scariest movie ever. I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm much more getting into horror now oh, really? than I was. Whereas, I hate, now, whereas yeah. now, I feel like if I see something uh, portrayed realistically, like, I don't know, someone breaking their arm or something, yeah. I really wince more now than yeah. I ever would have as a kid. Sure, sure, sure. Because I feel like I really know what that feels like. Yeah. Those films aren't really the ones you sort of cry at, though, are they? I'm oh, no, the sorry, I got talking about horror, didn't yeah, I? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Poor Jerry's crying at uh, Hostel 2. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I do cry. I do cry. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I don't weep because I feel like when those emotions are being stirred too much, I have the added <laughs> advantage of being able to remove myself and think about the technicalities. That's true. Yeah, uh, yeah. To, to take Why am I being it. made to feel like this? Despite the, the horror, there are, surprisingly, at the fir- certainly the first hour... A few moments of levity as well. Yes. That I actually laughed at. Yes. I completely forgot. There's one moment where he's picking his secretary, which I quite liked. Oh, yes. As uh, he's clearly finding them more and more attractive as they go on. And you can just, you see him closer and closer and closer to them with each interview. Yeah. Which is just, it's, it's quite a nice little spielberg uh, film. Yeah. It's a little technique he uses, which he does in quite a few of his films. Yeah. And then there's a really good moment where his wife comes to visit. And uh, she says sort of, um, well, sh- do you want me to stay or should I go? If I'm not, if I'm going to be the only one, you know, you might as well put me on a train back to Berlin. Next scene. On the bye, <laughs> bye darling. <laughs> on the yeah. train back to Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what raises a smile, but certainly not a laugh. Yeah. 
which is in that uncomfortable thing, which is what we were talking about in The Colour Purple, that yeah. we felt Spielberg hadn't quite got right. Yes. Because we were very, very uncomfortable in some of that. Yes. It does raise a smile in the, like, the will of the human spirit, I think is what I'm trying to get at. Do you remember when Ray Fiennes shoots that guy because the chicken had been taken? Yes. One yeah. of his chickens had been taken or yeah. something. And he's like, nobody knows anything. And then the little boy steps forward. Yeah. And he's like, you did this. Yeah. And he's like, no, he, he did it. Yeah. I can't help but smile at that for the, uh, you know, the, the forethought of, yeah, the, yeah. of the little boy. The balls. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. The yeah. the will to live, the yeah. will to you know a moment that happened for, for I felt that as well. It's like look at the resourcefulness. Yeah, the resourcefulness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The when the women are they know they're being divided into the healthy and unhealthy, and they prick their own fingers with blood. Yes. To put uh, and put rub it on their cheeks like rouge and their lips, yeah. and their lips to make it look like they're healthier. Yeah. I thought, wow, that's that I would I, never I, have thought how I never have thought of that. Yeah. Um, that's. Just incredible things to think of. It's those little moments where I think, like, that's real human. That's real humanity happening right there. Exactly, and those the the, the will to live, the will to. um... And those are the things that people could have cut very easily from a film. Yes, but they add, even though they don't drive the story forward, they add so much about, like we said, the resourcefulness and the survivor, the you know the the will to survive. Yeah, what we're really talking about is. Those little moments actually create, for me, like the biggest amount of empathy because yeah. I see things like that and I think, I, I hope I would think like that in that situation. Yeah. It's seeing those little moments where you're like, ah, oh, yes, you know, they've, they, they've got it. They've really, um, you know, they're really in the moment. Yeah. And they're really using their initiative. You know, you can't help but admire that. Can yeah, you? absolutely. You're like, you're just like, oh, I just really hope I, oh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Also, while we're talking about that scene, I would say the bit which really, really churns my stomach. Where, remember when they get all the kids and they put them in those trucks? Yeah. And they're all smiling and waving and quite happy. Yeah. And then they dri- they drive the bottom of the frame and then you have all of the women realise the children are being taken away. And that shot... And they like, run yeah. towards them. Screaming. And that shot on like a handheld camera in the trucks, isn't it? Yeah. And you can just see the mother's... Desperately sort of trying to claw for them and trying to get them to yeah. come. Yeah. I hate oh, that scene. It's just... It's just just horrific. Yeah. The definition of horror. Yeah. True horror. Yeah. Like, what do you think about the running time? If you've been watching along with us, you'll know that this is a three hour and 20 minute long movie. Three hour 15, according, three hour... according to okay. Netflix. Yeah. It's a three hour 15 minute long movie. I mean... How did the, it's difficult trying to find the actual the time of day to watch this? But did you feel that that length? Yes, yeah. I have to admit I watched it in two parts. Did you? Yeah. Okay, because it's a long time to be exposed to that level of intensity. Yeah, I, I I'm the same actually. I I watched I watched sort of the first hour, um, and then which is sort of the bit where Schindler's being a bit more opportunistic, less sympathetic. And then once more of the horrific stuff comes to light, I watched it straight through. Yeah. But yeah, I had to take a break halfway through. Yeah. Because it, it is a, it's tough going. Yeah. It's tough going. But so important. And also, like Spielberg, uh, so had Spielberg had watched a number of documentaries about the Holocaust in order to help inspire him. One of them is called Shoah, um, which is a nine and a half hour Holocaust documentary, which is one of the biggest inspirations behind this film. Oh, right. Yeah. Which again is shot in black and white. And with the amount of stories you would have collected, the amount of source material and other people's stories like you need to draw on, yeah, it's going to be. So, I can imagine it's so difficult to actually cut, find what to include. Yeah, because it does but, as a film, it moves quickly. It does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it really but does. That's the thing about the sex aspects of the Second World War. Like it does move so quickly. It's only a few years between Jewish people living in their homes to being forced into a ghetto to yeah. being forced into a labour camp. Yeah, there's only a few years between those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, the movie the movie does seem to move really, really fast. But mm-hmm. you know, the, that's probably the reality of it, isn't it? It escalated so quickly. It did escalate quickly. We haven't talked much about Liam Neeson himself. How do you think he? Wa- this was like his first big film, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. He actually, did you know he helped audition Christian Bale in Empire of the Sun? No. He helped with the apparently he helped with the audition process as being a counterpoint for when they were doing those big open auditions for 
uh, all the kids that yes. could have played um, little um, little Jim. Yeah, because that's how Harrison Ford got in, ended up yep. being cast as uh, Han Solo as well, because yep. he was yeah the counterpoint, the person who you read to yep. when you were auditioning for Luke Skywalker's and exactly. Princess Leia's. Yeah, and then after that, him uh, Spielberg and Kate Capshaw saw Liam Neeson in a play. Um, they went to speak to him afterwards, and Spielberg hugged Kate Capshaw because it apparently was a very emotional performance. And Kate Capshaw said, "That's probably exactly what a uh, Oscar Schindler would have done." There you go. And, uh, he does also look quite a lot like the real Oscar Schindler as well. But. Well, yeah, I guess so. He's yeah. if if you want someone who is magnetic, good looking, and uh, um, you know you're gonna good looking and you know wants to cre- has a create a sort of presence about him you want a tall good looking actor yes so and Liam Neeson um was sort of perfect for that yeah 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 no he's absolutely he's very good in this I yeah, think. yeah yeah as I say like yeah not distract it's not distracting because obviously we all know how Liam Neeson speaks now with his natural accent. it's true I think he's sort of being it's it's weird seeing him because now we sort of see him in the sort of the renaissance of his career as sort of an action star yeah and now it's weird seeing him go back to when he was in his yeah. 30s or so and when he was playing very different roles it is however did you it's interesting to see all of these people because I mean do you recognise um, Helen Hirsch no who's she uh, she's Miss Honey in um, Matilda no yes the English teacher really yeah. that's her yeah so oh, it's, just, wow. it's just so odd to think you know watch, watching this and you're like it's Miss Honey from <laughs> Matilda I didn't notice that at all <laughs> Oh wow! I was gonna, I was gonna say, there's a bit because I think Liam Neeson's persona now, looking back, it does overshadow things a little bit because there's a bit where he goes to Auschwitz to try and rescue the women. Yeah, and he actually goes to the Nazis. That these women have a special, a particular set of skills. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just thinking, I was, all I was thinking is, I will find them. I will take them. <laughs> <laughs> but they wouldn't have had, that's only only overshadowed by what he's done since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do have to say, I, I do think yeah, Ray Fiennes out acts Liam Neeson. But it's the part as well, isn't it's it? It's the part and... Um... I have to say, one of my favourite bits of acting, you know, because it's as much about reacting as well as, you know, what's, yeah. what the other person is, is given giving i love the bit where you know nimnis has decided to take the other path and become a bit of a, a savior yeah and he's talking to ray fines after that party and he's drunk and they're sat not opposite each other now but like divided by a bench yeah, or, sure, or yeah, something yeah. i know what you mean yeah and he's it's that whole speech of like saying i pardon you that's exactly yeah the mercy that is that is power yeah and then you see the cogs again yeah going in ray fines head and then you you see him again. It's okay. It's okay. I pardon you. Wait, he practice he practices in the mirror. Yeah, the vanity I, yeah, of that. I know. I know. I pardon you. I yeah. pardon you. And then he decides that he sort of realizes. Gets bored. He, yeah, gets bored. Oh, that doesn't really suit me. And that leads on quite well to another one of my favorite bits of acting in this. And because we haven't actually mentioned Ben Kingsley that much as Stern. That's true. Who does? It's a very quiet role, but he does it perfectly. Yes. As some a strong-willed, quiet individual who is just doing his best to get through the horror. And there's a bit straight after that where Gerth has seen a boy drop a saddle and he's practising his pardoning. He's like, I pardon you. Yeah. It's fun. And then previously, this goes back to the suspense thing as well, he's told, Stern has told stories where people would turn their backs and he'd just shoot you in the back of the head. Yeah. And he's obviously witnessed this situation, gone, that's not like him at all. And he's then dismissed and he goes, walk, walks away. And you can see in his eyes that you think he, he thinks he's going to be shot. Yeah. And there's, he walks away. He's walking away and he gets a bit faster and faster. And then he even looks back a little bit and then carries on walking on. Yeah. And that's never mentioned at all as I think it's just, you can tell that's what's going through his mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just thought that was, that's, that's one of the best bits of acting. Yeah. If it's, really li- good. it's little moments like that where I feel like I am aware that there just is something that film sometimes can capture which stage can't. Yes. You could not see the nuance on no. Ben Kingsley's face captured on stage because depending on where you are in the theatre, you could not get close enough to see that thought process. No, exactly. Someone like Stern's character who is quiet and introverted, yeah. you wouldn't be able to represent them as well on stage. Yeah. True to, true to that, yeah. how that actor wanted to represent the character yeah. they'd and have to be bolder they'd have to be bigger I would say unlike yeah as I mean noticing Miss Honey from Matilda you can completely forget this is the same actor who played Gandhi mm-hmm. yeah. so, so different yeah. and and the 
the bad mobster boss in Sexy, Sexy Beast. Sexy Beast, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, um, it's not dis- it's, in his case, it's not distracting. Because, yes. Because he's a, such an introverted character. Yeah. Or Trevor Slattery in Iron Man 3. I haven't seen it. You haven't seen it? Oh. <laughs> well, people at home will know what I'm talking okay. about. Okay. <laughs> I don't have to explain it to you. Shall we talk about the second most important Oscar in this in this movie? The Oscar Awards. Yes. Yeah. So, so it won Best Picture, didn't it? It won Best Picture and it finally gave Spielberg his deserved Best Director. And I do think he deserved it for this film. And unlike someone like Martin Scorsese, who had... It had eluded him for a time and they decided to give it him... For The Departed. For whatever film that was yet yeah. The Departed, <laughs> rather than anything that was better than that. Um, well, I do quite like The Departed. Um, yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's not, not bad. Best. It's fine. It's not yeah. best. Yeah. Um, this fully deserved an Oscar, I think. Yes. And this, if you're going to give Spielberg an Oscar, you give it for Schindler's List. Yeah. I think it got nominated for 12 Academy Awards. It won uh, a few of the big ones and a few of the technicals as yeah. well. And Spielberg gave a very nice emotional speech yeah you can see it on youtube i'll post a link for it as well yeah um he, on, on our twitter page he also didn't take a fee for this movie Spielberg. did he not no nope. okay well that's easy to do when you're a millionaire isn't it <laughs> but fair enough yeah, yeah i don't know <laughs> that was more the angle i was going for yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, more fair enough than the, yeah. the fact that yeah we don't mention <laughs> But it is just, and this sort of sparked that sort of. You've seen extras, right? The sitcom. Yeah. That Kate Winslet theory that you know, if you want to win an Oscar, you do it. You know, you play make, a cripple. Or... Yeah, play. Yeah, make a Holocaust drama. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which, do you know? You know, after that, she actually did what? I think she won an Oscar for the Reader. Oh yes, the Reader. Yeah. Yeah, she won it for the Reader, in which uh, she she plays someone who's on trial for being a Nazi war criminal. Yes. <laughs> which is quite funny. She also got Ray Fiennes in it. It does have very fines in it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there you go. You kind of already mentioned this, but you know uh, Spielberg was sort of, yeah, he really wanted an Oscar, didn't he, for himself? Yeah. But it feels like with this movie, the work is more important than any accolade he could possibly get. Yes. Don't you feel that? Uh, Yeah. I feel like Spielberg was mature enough, and maybe this is one of the reasons why he waited, and why maybe he was finally granted one, is because it feels almost like he he didn't get the Oscar for himself. Yeah. It's almost like he got it for the piece of history which he managed to, to document the, the he, memory of it, and he does dedicate it to that. When in the yeah. does de- de- yeah. dedicate it to the people who died, yes. you know, the six million people who died during yeah. um, when he's accepting the award. Yeah, and I think cynics would say, "Oh, yeah, this is an Oscar bait movie," but I think that may have. I feel the time. The, the, I, feel, I feel enough time has passed, even from nineteen ninety three, that when you watch that as a film, you care so much more about the people and the emotions you don't care that it won Oscars no exactly and I think Oscar baiting is more of a modern sensibility it's yeah. something that's a bit more cynical that us millennials have now put on films yeah. whereas it's back that, it's in that the... cynicism which has come out of the fact that that, yes, that exactly. has actually won exactly. it wasn't doing it in a sort of like ironic sense that we now see it Like the, yeah. it, it just was this is this is movie is not you can tell it's not made to garner awards. It's yeah, it's made exactly. it's made to tell an important bit of history. Yeah. And tell a story that hasn't been told like this as well on film since. Yeah. So thank you for listening. Um I hope you found this episode interesting. And although it's a bit more somber, a bit more serious than our previous episodes, I think just as important. But we do talk about yeah. the filmmaking process a bit but I, more. But I do this. also feel like if Spielberg took this ride and that's the ride that we're on. I feel like we have to address it. Oh, absolutely, as, as, yeah, as yeah. well. So, and I'm definitely glad I watched it again because yeah. it's such an such a good film. Yeah, we just hope we didn't ruin your day. Much, <laughs> yeah, imagine watching the movie and then listening to this on the same day. Yeah, this is like I pity you. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, you can always follow us on Twitter. We're on the handle at Big Boat Podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at The Bigger Boat Podcast. Um, You can email us if you want to chat about anything that we've said or ask us any particular questions. And you can email us on thebiggerboatpodcast at gmail.com. Remember, we're still doing the uh, Spielberg Best Of Tournament where you can vote for your favourites. We will be having a bit of change of tone uh, when we see you next week because we'll be talking about Jurassic Park The Lost World. Which I'm quite looking forward to, actually. Yeah, I'm quite looking forward to it. I haven't seen that for years. Yeah, because I think I've told this story in the podcast before, but this is the movie that when I got given this gift as a VCR by my nana made me burst into tears because I was so scared of dinosaurs and being eaten. Aww. Such a wimp. 
man. Such a wimp. <laughs> no wonder I didn't have friends. So, we will see you next week. Okay? Bye. Bye.